Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I have a special guest, Mark Sanders. He's the president of Harvest USA. And Harvest USA has been around since the 80s. They're in Pennsylvania. They bring the truth of, and mercy of Jesus Christ by helping individuals and families affected by sexual struggles and by providing resources that address biblical sexuality to individuals and churches. It's a really great organization. And today we're going to be discussing two uh, new video courses that are free on their website that uh, are amazing. One is called Raising Sexually Faithful Kids, and the second one is called Parenting Boys and Girls in a Gender-Confused World. So I'm excited to have Mark on the show. Welcome, Mark Sanders. Thanks, Bickett. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being coming on. So give us... You're so tell us a little bit. I mean, I mentioned, you know, what Harvest USA, what the mission statement is, but tell us a little more about what is Harvest USA. Yeah, Harvest USA is a ministry uh, that started in 1983 in downtown Center City, Philadelphia, uh, really was birthed out of 10th Presbyterian Church down there. And there are a lot of reasons why it started there, but one of them is because uh, that block in Center City is where it was the gathering place for many male prostitutes at the time. And so the missions committee and the, and the pastoral staff said, you know, we have an unreached people group right at our front doorstep, and we should be seeking to minister to them. And so Harvest USA really started that way as an outreach uh, to the gay and lesbian community there in Philadelphia. And we saw many people come to know Christ, uh, come to forsake sin and, and turn to him and find freedom and healing and repentance. And over the years, uh, I would say into the 90s, into the early 2000s with the rise of the internet, uh, we really started seeing more and more people coming to us, not just with issues of same-sex attraction, but also struggling with pornography, uh, adultery, affairs issues. And really, we just started to branch into any type of sexual brokenness, sexual struggle. And the same gospel applies to all these issues. And so the same kind of hope that we are offering people wrestling with same-sex attraction is the same hope we're offering people who are caught up in a pornography addiction or in um, visiting prostitutes or whatever may be the case. And so, uh, yeah, our ministry uh, ministers to both men and to women who struggle, but we also minister to the spouses of those who are struggling because often in our churches, we can, if we're ministering on any of these levels, we can focus sometimes solely on the person struggling and not realize the collateral damage uh, that is happening in their families if they're married, especially their spouses, but their children as well. Mm -hmm. And so we have a ministry dedicated for spouses. And um, then we also have a ministry dedicated now for parents, uh, particularly whose children identify as LGBTQ+. And, um, you know, historically, I would say 10 years ago, that ministry was by and large uh, many parents whose sons were uh, coming out as gay or their daughters coming out as lesbian. But now uh, more and more, it's many daughters coming out as trans or non-binary. And uh, we have support groups for all of these different types of ministries that we do. Yeah, and your your resources are great um, on harvestusa.org. So we're gonna today we're gonna talk about these teaching videos, these two new teaching videos you have on your website. Uh, the first one is called "Raising Sexually Faithful Kids." Kind of give us a broad overview of what that is. About. Yeah. So. So one of the things uh, we try and do, you know, often the ministry that we're doing here in our office is what we would call reactive ministry. There's there's a problem happening and people are coming to us because they see a problem in their own hearts and their own lives or in the, the, the lives of their family members. And so especially with our parents ministry, again, children are already struggling with these things, are already identifying a certain way, are already caught up in pornography. And um, we're there to kind of pick up the pieces. But more and more, we, we're trying to create resources that are not only helping uh, people and families respond to things, but also be proactive. So not just reactive, but proactive and proactively, preventatively figure out how do we help our kids so that they don't all have to go down this path, um, that, that we could guide them and shepherd them in a way that the way I like to think about it is maybe 50 years ago, parents could be a little more uh, hands off with some of these things and their kids wouldn't be caught up in a ton of these things. But today it's just not an option for parents anymore. And uh, we just see the ongoing uh, 
more and more parents are saying, we need help. We don't know how, what, how to respond to what our kids are dealing with at school. We don't know how to respond to social media and what our kids are seeing on the internet. Uh, we need some resources. So that was really the, the reason for creating Raising Sexually Faithful Kids is to basically a bit, be a foundation course for parents uh, to help them think proactively about how can I raise my child from a very early age up and through teenage years until they leave the house in such a way where they're getting not only content, but they're getting a relationship with us and they're getting a safe environment where they're going to be nurtured, they're going to be discipled, they're going to be protected uh, so that they can be what we call talk about as the soil of their lives. You know, if their seeds, if their heart is a seed, they're being in a, a healthy, uh, productive soil that's going to nurture their growth in Christ. Mm, that's great. And so let's take a look kind of um, specifically at at this the, this teaching video series. So unit, there's four units in this series, in each series, I think, uh, in each of these two series. So the first unit in this one is looking deeper than the fruit. It's discovering colon looking deeper than the fruit. What what is that about? Just briefly. Yeah, we we want to start reading sexually faithful kids to help parents think about their children as complex image bearers of God living in a fallen world, which means they're dealing with a combination of sin and suffering and how the gospel brings speaks into that. And so I think often when we when we think about our children struggling with various things, uh, we may be quick to think, let me just deal with the behavior. So if I find that my child is looking at pornography or they're starting to be sexually active, let me just cut off that bad behavior. Or you could think of your behavior, if we're like a tree that the Bible often talks about human beings, that's like the fruit of their tree. Mm -hmm. And we just want to cut off that bad fruit. But we want to help parents see that that behavior, those actions stem from deeper parts of their being and their hearts and their experiences. And it's a, it's a, it, the solution is much more than just cutting off bad behavior, but it's about transforming uh, their lives through the power of Christ. And so the first unit of this, of this series is really helping parents understand, in a sense, the redemptive arc of the Christian life, that we're born as image bearers of God, but we're corrupt through the fall. And so our hearts are naturally bent away from him. And uh, because of that, we need a new heart for, first and foremost that is made alive to God in Christ Jesus. Uh, but even with new hearts, even if your child comes to profess faith in Christ, uh, there's still a lot of struggles going on. And so we, we, we start to think about the fact that especially in early ages, they're being shaped by a multitude of factors that they, that they didn't have control over. They didn't have control whether they were born a boy or a girl. They didn't have control over the family culture they were born into, uh, the school environment they're in, um, their different personality and gifts, giftings and all these types of things. So many of these things, even um, trauma they might experience or spiritual warfare, all these things are shaping their desires, their beliefs, the way they respond to the world. And we, we want to help them to see not only how they've been influenced in their childhood, but then also what their actions are showing about their desires, the deeper core issues, that it's that we always do what we ultimately want. And usually our actions are, are speaking a deeper message than just, I'm lusting because of pornography, or I really wanted to have sex with this person. It's usually deeper core issues of, I'm looking for comfort. I'm looking for a sense of affection or intimacy or belonging, or I'm in a chaotic world and I want to have some sense of control. And this, this part of my life gives me that sense of control or security. Um, these are all deeper longings that ultimately are fulfilled in Christ and that we're often using counterfeit uh, idols, if you want to say, to, to satisfy those desires. And we also talk a lot about in that unit, the idea of um, our functional beliefs and the idea of your children might know a catechism, they might know a lot of Bible stories, they might have a great theology, and yet so often our behavior shows that what we truly believe is, is different than that professed theology. And so a simple example might be, they might say, yeah, Jesus loves me, uh, and the Bible tells me this, and yet their behavior shows that they really don't think Jesus loves them. Uh, they don't feel secure in his love. They're looking uh, for that security somewhere else, and, and when they think of God, they, they might think of him more as an angry judge, especially if they've been living under the shame of hidden sin struggles for many years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. They might only relate to God as judge and not as father. And so we want to help 
parents understand that it's in the context of all of these deeper issues in the soul that the behavior springs from. And so the response of parents is much more holistic than simply cutting off bad fruit, but it's through a relationship with them. Uh, we talk about parents, you are an influence on your children. You are part of their soil uh, that shapes them. And, and much more than just uh, limiting certain things or telling them, don't do this, do that, uh, you want to have a relationship with them that really provides them a picture of the heart of the father for them. Wow. I wish this vid these these video series were uh, around when I was a kid. <laughs> I could have used them because I always, you know, I when I was a kid struggling with same sex attraction, um, there was really no one to turn to. I mean, I couldn't I'd talk to my family because it was too embarrassing or shameful or um uh, taboo and um but this this would have <laughs> this would have been so helpful to me as a kid so th thank you for that and so let's go to unit two unit two is talking colon having the sex talks when yeah, do you have the sex talks with kids yeah well, I appreciate that you got the title right because it's not having the sex talk but it's talks it's and we we want to think about this less as you know and you know, many, many uh, people grew up and if they had any talk at all, it was a one time, you know, maybe 30 minute talk. Some people, they don't even I never have got a, talk. I never got a talk. I never got a talk. Yeah. Yeah. So you were lucky if you got a talk <laughs> at all. Um, some people have a book kind of slid under their pillow one night and they just <laughs> happen to find it and the parents hope that their kids read it. Uh, but yeah, we see this more as an ongoing dialogue with children. And uh, we think there, there's many ways you could do this, but we break it up into three different categories of talking, and it's based on age groups. So, you know, when they're toddlers, you want to give them the basic vocabulary of, you know, physical anatomy. What are our body parts? Why are my body parts, if I'm a boy, different than my sisters, who's a girl? Those types of things. Uh, you want to talk about body safety issues, you know, where people should be touching you, where they shouldn't be touching you. Um, and then... As they get into those uh, later years, like seven to 12 years old, uh, you want to start having more intentional conversations with them that are topical, that, okay, let's let's have the anatomy of sex talk. Let's start to talk about um, why are kids starting to, to um, identify certain ways at school or, or, you know, why is lust sinful and why should we turn from that? Um, and we, we have talk about two different types of conversations at this stage. We think about what do we call as you go conversations that are just you know, throughout life, things are going to come up. You're going to drive past a billboard that has inappropriate things on it, and your kids mm -hmm. might notice it. How do you not just avoid, don't look at that, but actually have a moment for a conversation about, you know, how did God create us as image bearers who have dignity in our bodies? And do th does that billboard, you know, show dignity? Um, or is that something that is not what God wants for us to do? Um and we also want to, at this stage, start to think through the deeper theology and structure of sex. Why is sex created? You know, God is the most pro-sex when it comes to how he created humanity. The very first command in the Garden of Eden was to be fruitful and multiply. So clearly this is a good gift that God has given to humanity, but it's meant to be stewarded in the right context, in that covenantal union of marriage between one man and one woman. And so, you know, giving them a good positive theology of sex that not only shows the obvious natural good of it in terms of companionship and marriage and love and intimacy and uh, creating children, but also the deeper structures of marriage pointing to Christ in the church and why this is only properly uh, exemplified through one man and one woman, and ultimately how this points to the ultimate wedding supper of the Lamb, where there will be no human marriage because the marriage of Christ and his church, uh, that that consummation has fully occurred at that point. So, so th those are all many different types of topical conversations. You don't have to have them all in one, you know, intense four-hour session, but throughout that kind of season where they're in the tween kind of season. And then once they get to teenagers and into high school, uh, hopefully you've done a lot of that building at that point already, because, you know, lecturing a 16-year-old is probably not going to be that fruitful at that point. Mm -hmm. So this is where we want to move more into the dialogue stage and, and having conversations where, you know, maybe they they heard all these things, but they're starting to doubt it. They're starting to see things on on the internet, on TV with their friends, and their friends are telling them a different message than what they heard growing up. And now you have an opportunity to start to have some of that back and forth where you're really wanting to hear what do they believe? What do they truly believe about these things? What are the questions they have? And so it's it's much more listening now and and letting them share 
what they're wrestling with. And it's really about helping them to understand that this is the, the normal Christian life is we come up against things that are going to challenge our faith, but we have a rock solid, but where do we go to for a firm footing? What's our foundation ultimately? So those are, that's the idea of this. Everything in this course is about relationship. Everything's about the relationship with you have that you have with your kids is going to be what fuels raising sexually faithful kids. And that's good. Okay. So the third unit in this, in this series is called protecting colon navigating the technological terrain, which is crazy right now. So what, what tell us a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah. So, um, there's a lot of ways that parents uh, need to be proactive in protecting their kids, uh, particularly in our day and age. But uh, this unit particularly focuses on technology and the idea that, you know, what we see here is that it doesn't matter if parents homeschool, private school, public school, uh, we see parents in all of those categories and their kids are struggling with the same things, uh, presenting the same worldviews, the same sin, sin struggles. And we see the Internet being the common denominator with all of them. And so, uh, so yeah, this is really about seeing that, you know, you can teach your kids all the right things, but the reality is, is that if they're getting exposed to things that they really have zero capacity to process at young ages, and, you know, the average exposure to things like pornography is getting younger and younger every year, I would say it's maybe... Uh, average might be 11 years old today. And that's that's on the high side, perhaps, for what many kids uh, are exposed to in terms of the average age. And so, so there's just a whole world. We talk about it like thinking about it's good to train your kids how to ride a bike when they're young, but you're not going to give your 10-year-old the keys to the BMW. Uh, it's too much power in their hands. They don't know how to utilize that. And so, so similar to the talks, you want to have age-appropriate boundaries around technology where you're appropriately guarding them from things they shouldn't be exposed to, while over time uh, increasing the accountability that they have to be able to start to be trained in technology in a way so that when they leave their home, it's not like going from zero to 60 right away, uh, but you're starting to train them throughout the years. And there's so many studies that are done more and more. And we talk about this a lot in our second course when it comes to the... Uh, the world is waking up to the idea that things like social media and the internet are just having a profoundly negative impacts yes. on teens today. And the, the prevailing uh, agreement would be that you should not have social media in the hands of a teenager until they're at least 16 years old. As, as And the same goes for a smartphone as well. And so, um, so we go into a lot of the things about, you know, uh, basically the two categories in this unit are filtering and blocking. How do you block and filter bad content? And then how do you monitor that content um, so that you can really see exactly what your kids are seeing and you can track, okay, how much time are they spending on their favorite site? Or have they gotten access to something they shouldn't have had, had access to? And thankfully, there are more and more um, uh, services offered to parents. Now, you pay a, a nominal fee, a subscription basis type of thing, where they'll do a lot of that monitoring for you. And so even though the technology has gotten more and more uh, brings greater access to dangerous material, there's also greater helps uh, that are available to families as the technology grows. Yeah, that's good. And so, and then the last unit in this series is walking, colon, helping a struggling child. What, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so this is um, your your 13 year old, you find out has been looking at pornography or your daughter has sent a sexual text to her boyfriend or your child says that they're struggling with same sex attraction or gender dysphoria. Um, and we go into a lot more on the gender dysphoria in the second in the second course. Um, but yeah, how do you respond? How do you how do you walk with them? And so we think about a few things we think about. First of all, we try and encourage parents that, you know, this is a scary thing for parents and uh, there, there can be a, a way in which they need to guard their own hearts first and they need to realize that their savior is compassionate and gracious towards them because they're probably going to have a lot of questions. You know, what did we do wrong? And is, can God help us in this? Are we going to lose our child? You know, all these fears start to come in. And when we're responding in fear, that's usually not going to be a good response. It's not going to be loving for your child. It's not going to honor the Lord. And so we really want to, first of all, give parents a, a foundation to run to their Savior in the midst of the storm, um, you know, that he's in control of the storm. And uh, But then we want to help them to think about the initial conversation. What does that initial response look like when you either catch your child 
uh, in something or by God's grace, they even come to you and confess that this is what's going on. And so thinking about those initial conversations of, you know, expressing your, your thankfulness that they're talking to you about this, that you care for them, that this doesn't change your love for them, uh, but that you want to walk with them in this, that this is something that uh, makes you want to uh, get to know them better and all these things. And so, so that initial conversation to make sure that you are keeping the door open for for, and, and I know for myself, when I was uh, a teenager struggling with uh, internet pornography and other things, I, I eventually got caught and I talked to my dad about it. And his response changed everything for me because he was so gracious to me, which mm. I wasn't necessarily sure how he would respond. But the fact that he did not kind of jump all over me, you know, he set some some good boundaries, but he also just it made me want to talk to him more about everything in my life, not just that area, but it made it clear if I'm struggling again, I don't have to wait to get caught again. I can, I can talk to him. And so I just think that's, that makes a world of difference and will change your relationship with your parents on so many levels. Uh, if parents are able to, that, that first response matters. Now, sometimes parents don't respond well in the beginning and they might need to go back and apologize, but that too can be a powerful experience when, especially if you haven't been good at this historically is to humble yourself before your child and to say, you know, mom and dad, we're sinners too. And yeah, we were scared and we responded out of that fear, but that's, that, that shows that we need to trust Christ with this more. And so, so that, that initial response, we talk about that a lot. And then we go into um, just more of walking with your kids and helping them think through what we talked about with those categories of desires and beliefs and helping your children understand what are those deeper issues that need to be unrooted, that need the, the gospel to start to break in and transform at the heart level, not just the behavior. Uh, for example, helping the daughter who sent a sexual text, help her to see that maybe she was looking for uh, this boy that she sent that to, to fill something in her, a sense of value, a sense of worth, a sense of intimacy that, that he could never provide. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's what she was looking for. You know, maybe she didn't even want to send the text. It felt demeaning to her. It felt degrading, but she felt like she had to do it. Um, and so, so there are ways in which you can start to get to those deeper issues and help them to see how we, we bring our desires and our sufferings to Christ. And he, and he meets us in those things and he cares for us and he's going to compassionately bear those burdens. Um, and he's going to forgive us through his, through his blood, but then also help them to see that the opposite of sexual sin is not just not doing it, but, uh, giving them pro proactive ways to, to love their siblings. If they have siblings to, to be a, what we talk about, we want all people to become more and more fully functioning members of the body of Christ. And so, um, so giving them opportunities to, to practice love, to practice faith, uh, in these areas and and to see this as a longer journey uh, with your kids, that this usually isn't a quick fix, but much more of a journey where you're helping them uh, see what the normal Christian life is all about, that it's a this gradual, progressive uh, turning from sin, turning to Christ and seeing that his grace is more than sufficient for these things. Yes. Amen to that. So, <clears throat> okay, the second video series is called Parenting Boys and Girls in a Gender-Confused World. So what's kind of the overview of that, that series? Yeah, so so this is um, this could act as a standalone course. You don't need to watch Raising Sexually Faithful Kids to, to benefit from the course, although it's better if you watch Raising Sexually Faithful Kids first, um, but this very much can be its own separate thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the overview of the four units are basically helping parents understand how did we get here as a culture when it comes to a biblical um, appraisal of what does the Bible say about where our culture is at today? And so we go into Romans 1 a lot and the idea of um, abandoning the creator, worshiping the creation, these types of ideas and what that means for our worldviews and where that takes us, uh, but also the idea of just what are so, and so uh, if if your audience knows Carl Truman's book uh, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self we kind of we don't do that but we give a similar kind of take on some of the things when it comes to the waves of feminism and gender ideology and how all of these things are leading to this place where we've come to this point where uh, we've really deconstructed this gender binary uh, as a culture and so that's kind of the first unit then we go into kind of zooming in more at where kids are at today and why it is that uh 
the 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 numbers of children identifying as transgender and non-binary have just skyrocketed uh sometimes 1000% in certain school districts or in the UK it was 4000% uh, uh in certain school districts so what why is that what why is that happening how do we account for this and so we go into all the different factors that are contributing to that in unit 2 and then at unit 4 or unit 3 we look at uh how to, similar to the talks in the first course, we think about the talks with gender and how to have uh, proactive talks about building a positive theology of gender. And then the final unit is very similar to the first course of uh, how do you help your child if either they just start uh, being sympathetic to their friends who are identifying as non-binary and they're thinking, you know what, I think the Bible's wrong on this. And, you know, my friend who's, who's trans or non-binary, like, I think they're right and I want to support them in that. How do you help your child if, if they're in that ally phase um, or if if they themselves are starting to say, maybe maybe my problem is that I, too, was born in the wrong gender or that I'm identifying the wrong way and uh, how to walk with your kids in that. Yeah. And so, OK, let's look a little bit more specifically. So unit one is called Standing Firm on a Biblical Foundation. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. So so like I said, that's getting into just kind of the biblical explanation for how do, does the Bible account for where we're at? Or do, do, do we have no help in scripture? And we would say, no, it very much, uh, there's nothing new under the sun in that sense that we can look at scripture. We can look at places like Romans one and give a, give an accurate picture of how we got here. And that this is not a surprise to God and it shouldn't be a surprise to his people that we've come here as a culture. Mm -hmm. And again, going into those deeper, uh, structures of gender ideology, uh, the impact of things like feminism, uh, the way in which even there's, uh, like, how did we get to a place where where, where we're really deconstructing that there's any value to, to identifying as gender, as, as sexual beings at all, and even the inconsistencies within uh, the gender movement, that there seems to be one camp saying one thing and another camp saying another thing, and uh, just seeing how do we get here. So it's, it's very much that, that larger framework, trying to, trying to just situate ourselves in that. Yeah, that's good. And so in unit two, the title of that unit is the tree model applied to a gender confused generation. What is that about? Yeah. So the tree model is what we introduced in, um, in the first, in the first course in raising right. sexually faithful kids, that was the soil. The, so we basically take that same model we use in raising sexually faithful kids and apply it to gender struggles specifically. And, uh, what we and we go into a lot of different factors. We, we talk a lot about the cultural impact and the idea that, Historically, and we, we borrow a lot from Abigail Schreier's uh, work and what she's done in documenting kind of, you know, why is it then in 2007, there were zero clinical studies done for girls who were struggling with gender dysphoria? Why were there zero studies done? And why is it that, you know, the, the rate uh, in 2007 was one in 10,000 kids, uh, which is very low compared to what it is today. What has happened in the course of about 10 or 15 years that we're where we're at today. And so we really go into the idea of the social contagion yeah. aspect and really want to want to distinguish what we would what you could call classic gender dysphoria, which was usually exclusively for the most part, boys would exhibit this as early as two to four years old. And upwards of 70, you know, different studies show different percentages, but many of them would go on to resolve that. Uh, by the time of adulthood, and so so the, so that's that's a very different phenomenon uh, that's what, than what's happening today. So we would see them as really separate issues in a sense of of these different things. But what's happening today is largely not classic gender dysphoria, but much more the social contagion aspect. And when you start to like get, kind of get under the hood of what's happening, I think you see a lot of very uh, different dynamics culturally all coming together for this final solution of changing my gender, changing my identity, that will solve these problems. And so we start by even saying like, there are problems with these younger generations, like highest rates of, of anxiety, depression, anorexia, suicidality. It's just like over, over the past 10 years and then in COVID and other things have really spiked. And how do we account for this? And so uh, we borrow from Jonathan Haidt, uh, who's, who's a sociologist, has done a lot of work in these areas, the coddling of the American mind with him and Greg Lukianoff. 
And uh, we look at the idea of overprotection and the idea that uh, we've sought to so protect kids from negative experiences today that we're actually have stunted their ability to face anything hard. And so I equate it to the idea if you grew up in a home where you were constantly told to wash your hands because you were, your parents were afraid that you would get sick. Uh, in that environment, you actually probably got sick all the time uh, because your immune system wasn't given the ability to adapt and, and learn how to fight off disease. So that same kind of phenomenon we see happening with kids today where they're unable to face hard things because they've been uh, we've been so c concerned about legitimate things like bullying and other things that are legitimate concerns, but have gone way too far. And so now they're kind of left, we need trigger warnings and safe spaces and all of these things because we we don't have this, the skills and tools to, to grow through hardship and adversity. And yeah. so you've got kind of that on the one mm -hmm. hand. And then on the other hand, you have um, what we see as often a gateway is uh, um, things like... Uh, activism that's very that's very prominent in in college campuses and these types of things so you've got overprotected kids they they see injustice happening and these all these things kind of come together to say uh, there's problems in the world and our, our what is our solution to these problems and and it's it's often a kind of victim mentality that my problem is outside of myself it's someone else uh working against me and so and so and and uh, we do know that the rates of suicidality are very high for, for children who identify as, as transgender. And yet it's, it's usually these other comorbidity factors right. uh, that, are, that are not only the uh, contributing to these issues, but then we're also seeing trans as kind of the solution that's, that's brought into it. And so, so the, the activism part with a worldview that's being presented, the, the gender bi binary is being broken down, uh, you have activism coming in. So you've got all these different things that are kind of working together. And then you have social media and social media probably being the thing where all of these ideas are being proliferated. And uh, what we see on social media, especially with uh, these influencers, you know, there, there's one statistic of... Um, you know, some videos on TikTok are getting 30 million views and close to a million likes. And uh, these influencers are documenting their entire story of transitioning. And, and it, it's this combination of both being seen as incredibly heroic. Uh, look at this hero of mine who has overcome these adversities, but it's also seen as very glamorous. And man, maybe I could do that as well. And, and then these influencers are speaking into these kids' lives and they're saying, you know, your parents, if they don't support you, they're toxic. And, you know, we can be more family to you than they'll ever be. And what you see is this kind of cult-like manipulation happening through social media, where it's kind of this, it's saying, sowing seeds of doubt into the people who truly care about you, your parents, your church, your community. They don't care about you. They don't love you. They're holding you back. We are the ones who really care about you, even though we've never met you, even though, uh, you know, all these things. And so uh, there's just all these factors. So I, I could go into many more things, but that's just a, a taste uh, a little bit of a preview into a lot of the different factors that are contributing to kids identifying these ways today. Yeah, <clears throat> there was a report that um, I, I'm sure you saw it that 40% of the students at Brown University <laughs> identify as LGBTQ. I'm like, what is going on? This is absolutely absurd. Mm -hmm. Like when I was in college, there was probably like 2%. Um, right. So yeah. Um, anyway, so let's go to the next one. Uh, the talking to your kids about gender issues, unit three. Yeah, so this is this is really building kind of the positive theology. And so like exactly what you said, you know, why is it that 40 percent of kids are identifying? Because their theology, their their idea of themselves, uh, what they believe about God and themselves is basically a big blank slate. It's just be whoever you want to be. You have to kind of figure it out for yourself. Um, there's no rules. There's no standard to judge your identity. Just be whoever you feel inside and, and you know, go along the way. And you might have to change, you know, every year that might shift, you know, as your feelings change. And so, so really the unit three is saying you don't, kids don't have to grow up in that environment. And we, we challenge parents, just try to put yourself 
in the shoes of a 14 year old kid today. Like by God's grace, I don't recall struggling with uh, gender issues growing up, but I recall struggling with shame. I recall struggling with awkwardness, all these things that if I didn't, if there was these things pre being presented to me as a kid, maybe I would have identified those ways as well. And so I think it's helping parents see that they do need to fill that void or something's going to fill it. Something's going to fill that vacuum, even if that vacuum is itself another vacuum of meaning and, and identity. And, and the kids are be basically being forced uh, to identify themselves. And yeah. so, yeah, unit three is all about basically giving that uh, we go into basically creation, fall, sin, re redemption, or consummation, or creation, fall, uh, redemption, consummation, and try to like map out the biblical story as it relates to gender. So how did God create us as gender beings? How does the fall impact us as gender beings? How does Christ come as one who who was engendered, who did take on a body and took on that shame? And then how is ultimately consummation where our bodies are made new? You know, no more distress, no more shame, no more discomfort uh, will be perfectly the image bearers that he always created us to be. I can't wait for that. Amen. <laughs> Lord, come back. So, okay. So the last unit in this course is called helping your hurting child with gender confusion and struggles. What's that about? Yeah, so this is this is kind of what so <clears throat> many parents today are, are reaching out to Harvest USA for help with, which is... My, my teenage daughter, my teenage son, they, they've come out as trans, as non-binary. What do we do? And uh, we, we start out by wanting to temper expectations because the reality is so many parents come to us and they say, what can, what can I do to change my child? And the reality is there's not a lot parents have control over at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and particularly once, once children get to a certain age where these ideologies have really started to harden over time, uh, it, there's there's no one size fits all solution where oh just do this and your child will abandon all of these things, and so we want to temper expectations and say similar to the talks, there are certain stages along the way that is going to certain when your kids are younger there there's more work to be done uh, there's more uh, potential for uh, a change to happen but once they get to those teenage years uh, we want to temper expectations that parents don't feel like oh my my child didn't abandon this. They're still going full bore that they somehow did something wrong. And so we start by tempering expectations about uh, depending on where your child's at. Uh, and then we then we go into the idea of what do you, how do you set boundaries in your home? You know, do you allow your child to identify as a, as different pronouns or a different name or to wear clothing of a certain type? Uh, all these things and, and how to work together if if it's if it's a couple who's married. Uh, how do how do you come to consensus on that? And and again, a lot of that has to do with the age of the child and and to to what degree are you going to say, okay, we'll let you dress a certain way, but we're not communicating to you that that means we're approving of what you're doing. Uh, but similar to the technology talk, there's wisdom involved in. Um, what kind of boundaries you set in their home, given the fact that they might leave in a year or two at that point. But we talk a lot about the idea of helping parents see, like, especially before puberty, if this is prepubescent uh, angst going on, then um, social transitioning, any type of social transitioning, whether it's pronouns or name or dress, studies show that that usually always leads to physical transition of some kind. And so you're setting emotion. So if you think, oh, well, we'll just let our child social transition, but they won't do anything with their bodies. That's just not what happens uh, statistically with children. And so it usually sets this course in motion. And so especially when they're younger, we really want to encourage parents to have stricter boundaries with those things and to, to help parents see that, you know, things like puberty blockers, we go into all the medical uh, not all the medical, but we try to help them see these are not just putting pause on puberty, that these have a ton of uh, negative side effects that have been documented and are not being used uh, for the purpose that the, that the medications were intended to be used to begin with, that they're being used in off-label manners. Um, so we talk about the kind of boundaries to set, and then we go into kind of how do you how do you walk with your child in your relationship with them? And we, we talk a lot about things like, for example, celebrating the gender that God created them to be. There's, they were born a, boy, born a boy, celebrate the fact that God made them a boy and that you're, you're thankful that he created them this way. Um, 
address relationship issues that might be going on with your with your child, you know, with maybe the same sex or opposite sex parent. You know, is there ways that you can spend more time together? Are there things that are causing your child to pull away from you? Uh, we talk a lot about just spending time with your kids. You know, we're so busy today that um, are we giving adequate time to spend with your kids? Another thing might be pulling them out of a school they're in if you have that freedom and and kind of mobility to do that. Um, if school is an issue, if that's if that's kind of a danger point for them where they're getting indoctrinated in school, do you have the financial resources or the community resources to put them somewhere else? Uh, there's one story of a mom who pulled her kid out of school because her kid, her daughter was starting to to identify this way and moved her into like some very rural area where there is no technology, no internet, and and her daughter abandoned all those things. Um, and so, so there are some kind of radical steps that parents can take when it comes to technology, when it comes to schooling. And we, we wanna make clear that, you know, some parents are thinking, I can barely make my rent payment. I can't afford private school. I don't have the time to homeschool. And so we really just encourage parents to have you prayed about it. At the very least, are you, are you bringing this decision to the Lord and saying, Lord, if my kid has to go to public school, I, I'm going to pray every single day that you protect them, uh, that you that you have a shield and a hedge of protection around them in that environment. Um, but then we also go into the just kind of the ongoing conversations you can have. You know, when it comes to uh, dress, you know, okay, so your kid wants to dress um, in a certain way that you might think, well, you know, what is that saying about their heart? And starting to have conversations about why they want to dress that way and what are they seeking to communicate? Because sometimes there are unfair cultural stereotypes that they might be rightly pushing up against. Uh, but I think we want to help kids see the way in which, well, what are you, what do you, what do you want to communicate? Are you wanting to push up against rigid cultural stereotypes that might be, might be praiseworthy? Or are you seeking to communicate through your dress that you wish to identify as the opposite sex, as the opposite gender? And so, so it's getting, getting at the hard issues and then helping kids see that Jesus is there for them, that the normal Christian life is we go through struggles. Again, if you're if you as parents are able to understand and uncover some of those underlying issues, issues with depression, issues with anxiety, you know, for example, autism is uh, is a big factor for children who identify as trans right now. It's like 10 times higher the rate of autism in the trans community than than outside of it. And so there's all these underlying factors that you can be ministering to. And then how do you bring those things to Christ? How do you bring your anxieties, your depression, your struggles, and take away from a false savior that really cannot help you and bring them to a savior who's going to, not going to promise immediate relief from all of your problems day one, but it's a true hope. It's a living hope. He's a real hope that is... Um, is something that we ultimately are looking forward to. And that's something we talk a lot about in the last year you know, is this idea of parents modeling the hope they want their kids to have. And we, we look at 1 Peter 1.13, where it talks about setting our hope fully on the grace that will be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so there is a sense in which transgender ideology is a denial of the life to come. It's saying there is no hope for the body after it's in the grave. This is all you have. You've got to get as much immediate comfort and relief as possible right now because Jesus is not coming back and he won't make all things new and your hope should not be placed in him. And so we really want to help them anchor their hope in what is true and real. Yeah, and and then each of the, the courses come with discussion questions and participant guide. What are participant guides? Yeah, it's basically like outlines. So we um, we want to have this be very adaptable for a Sunday school setting or a weekend seminar that a church could put on. You know, you can do this for free in your home if you want, but your church can take this and do an eight week Bible a Sunday school out of it or something like that. So the discussion questions are meant to be done in a group, uh, and then the participant uh, guide is basically like a, an outline of each lecture. And then you recommend resources as well that will help people too. Correct. Yeah. Well, this is wonderful. And um, I really commend this to you guys who uh, are going through this with your kids or your family or, or people you love. And we will link below, we will link to uh, both courses and to just Harvest USA in general. 
And thank you, Mark Sanders, for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me, Beckett. It's been a, been a pleasure. All right, guys. Thank you. And we will see you next week.